my paranormal experiences started whenever I was a small child. I had dreams that come true. I started seeing people that everybody else couldn't see. And I had, you know, these experiences throughout my life. One of the experiences that I was going to tell you about is my husband and I, we met in 2017 at a birthday party for my cousin. And we went back a year later at the same location where we met and they were had this a big gathering. Everybody was like, you know, singing karaoke and stuff in the house. And we went back and it was storming. It was raining pretty hard that night. It was the strangest thing because you could see parts of the, where the clouds were moving and the moon was full and it was breaking through the clouds. You could actually almost see the ground in some areas, even through the rain. It was the strangest thing. And we were way down in the middle of the backwoods in Crossville, way back on this friend of ours property. It was way off any kind of public road. We were all standing on the porch, you know, talking and stuff. And my husband, Randy, he came up beside me and he was like angry with me and took off running off the porch in the rain in the night. I couldn't understand what he was doing. So I took off after him and Everybody was looking at me like, you know, what What are you doing? I just took off after him because I didn't know why he was upset. You know, here it was our one year anniversary and he was upset. So I go following out in the pouring rain, following him. And all I could see was the back of him. He would walk like 10 feet in front of me and then stop. I would get up close to him and I was like, what is wrong with you? I don't understand what is wrong with what is you know, what's come over you? And he wouldn't say anything. He would wait until I got like right up on him almost. And then he would take off and go another 10 feet or so and then come to a complete stop. And I would run up to him and I was getting angry up by this point. He led me all the way out to the end of our friend's driveway, which is probably about 200 yards or so in the pouring rain in the middle of the night. I was just screaming, what is wrong with you? And he just wouldn't say anything. Well, he took off. At this point, he was almost in a jog and he started down the gravel road that led out off the property and he just vanished. I couldn't find him anymore. I was down in this big dip. It goes up a hill and then it dips way down. And I was down in the middle of this big dip and this horrible stench, this foul smell just filled the air and it smelled like rotting flesh, dead meat and wet animal. And I was screaming by this point, screaming for him to, you know, come back and and help me because I didn't know, you know, I have been, it had been many, many years since I had been in the woods, you know, out like that by myself. And I have no sense of direction. Here I was, I had no way of protecting myself and he was gone. He just left and I couldn't understand. So I took off through the woods and I was running through the woods trying to find my way back because somehow I had gotten off the trail and I come upon this house in the middle of nowhere. The front porch light was on, but nobody was there and I was trying to get help and stuff. And I finally realized that nobody was going to come to my aid. So I took off around the house and went back down their driveway trying to find Jack's house. Well, I'm coming up through the yard and I see my cousin and one of our friends coming out the driveway looking for me. And I was like, what are you looking for me for? I said, it's in the middle of, we're in the middle of nowhere and it's pouring the rain. I'm freezing to death. We got to go get Randy. I don't know where he went. We've got to go get him because he's going to freeze to death because it's pouring the rain. It's very, very cold outside because of the pouring rain and we're in the middle of the night, but he's he's out there. We got to go find him. And they said, Wendy, he's in the house. And I was like, what? I said, he's in the house. What do you mean he's in the house? I said, I just followed him all the way out the road. And they said, no, he's in the house. And I said, I don't believe you. So I, I walked in the house and expected him to be soaking wet because I was soaking wet to the bone and he was dry. He had not been outside. I don't know who that was. I was following down the driveway. I have no idea. But 
from the time I set foot on Jack's property down there, I felt something, a presence down there that was wicked and not so pleasant. So I'm thinking that that had manifested itself and shown itself in the form of Randy to lure me out in the middle of the night. And if I had kept going, I don't know what would have happened to me that night. But every one of them just think that I was crazy. I was like, I just, I mean, it was the same build as Randy. He, Randy is six foot one. He weighs like 200 pounds. It was just like him. It was his same posture, same everything, except for he wasn't moving his arms. They were just down beside him. And he was very nonverbal and just weird but it was the same shape and everything. And that's not the only time that's happened to me. Well, my son brought it up that he said that it may have been like a shapeshifter or something, or I didn't know what these things were. I mean, I never really studied anything about shapeshifters or any kind of cryptids or anything like that. I just always thought that it was folklore. I didn't really, I mean, I've seen spirits and stuff my whole life. I've helped the police department find people. I've helped people in general find their loved ones. I see people and I can see things that they've done and things that may happen to them. I can't see that in all people, but I do see that often. I see spirits and I've had experiences with celebrities that I have journals about. But the next experience I was going to tell you about is this old friend of ours his name was Bob, and he was a dispatcher at a local company here in Knoxville. And my ex that I was with then, he he worked at this same establishment, and he was down as Bob's emergency contact. Bob didn't have any family here, and his brother he lived with had passed away, and it was just Bob alone. And I didn't know of any other family or anything that Bob had. I had no idea. Well, Bob didn't show up for work one day and my ex and my oldest son went over there to check on him because they had called my ex and told him that Bob wasn't at work. And that was unusual because Bob was always there, always on time. So they went over there and walked up to the house and Bob's door was open and he was on the couch. He had passed away. He had had a heart attack. So since nobody knew any of Bob's family, nobody knew anything about Bob. He didn't grow up here or anything. He moved here from Michigan and we didn't know anything about him. But the police kind of just told us that we needed to take over his estate and deal with it and deal with, you know, burying him and everything since we were his emergency contacts. Well, we went in and I didn't we didn't know anything about anything other than it was just Bob and his brother. Well, we were going through the stuff and we were trying to, you know, clean out his place that he was renting and, you know, go through the stuff and all this. I was trying to find any kind of information on any kind of family to try to, you know, get in touch with them to let them know what had happened. And I came over there one day and my ex was already in the, it was in a mobile home and it was all the way at the end. Of, he was all the way at the end of the mobile home. It was like a 16 by 80. And he was all the way at the other end. and But I walked up to the steps and I didn't know that. And I stuck my head in the door. And if you walk in the front door, you can go left or right. If you go right and then the first room to your left was Bob's computer room. And then if you take that right and go straight down the hall, it's the bathroom and then Bob's bedroom. Well, if you take the left, it goes into the living room and the kitchen, dining room, and then it goes into Richard's room, which was Bob's brother that passed away. Well, I walked in and I heard boxes and stuff being moved in Bob's computer room. I was hollering at my ex and I was like, where are you at? What are you doing? And I walked into the room expecting to see him there and there was nobody there. It was so strange because I had walked right up to the door and I could still hear the boxes being moved. But whenever I walked in, there was nobody there. Then I heard my ex yell from the other end of the mobile home and saying, I'm down here. So I walked down there and I said, I could have sworn that you were down there moving boxes. And he said, I've not even went down there and touched that area yet. And I said, okay. So I started looking around in Richard's room 
trying to find, you know, any kind of information I could. Well, my ex had stepped out and was going through some stuff in a building he had out back. And I heard someone moving boxes in Bob's office again. And so I went down there and the closer I got, I expected the boxes to stop moving, but they didn't. And whenever I walked in the door, there was Bob. But Bob wasn't in his human form. He looked like water. It was the strangest thing. He looked like, if I can describe it to anything, it would be like the predator, where the predator comes in there and you can see him. It's like water, but you can see through it, but it's got that ripple effect. That's what Bob looked like. But Bob was real short. He was like five foot one. And, you know, I could tell it was Bob, you know, it was his same structure and everything. And I could sense a person's spirit. It's like their fingerprint, like everyone has their own fingerprints. Everyone has their own spirit and everyone has their own feeling. There's people out there that have similar feelings that I have for that person. Whenever I see that person, the feeling that I get from that person, I call it their aura. They have similar, but nobody has the same one. And I knew that it was Bob. And so Bob pointed at this box in the top of the closet. I was kind of in shock that Bob was standing there because I never really expected that. The next thing I know, I walked out of the bedroom and then I heard a box sound like it fell. I turned around and went back into the office and looked and there was the box from the top of the closet sitting on top of the computer desk and it had a photo album and it was opened up to this woman's military credential papers and it was letters from her to Bob and stuff. It was Bob's sister who was in the military and it had all of her contact information of who I needed contact and everything. Well, I had gotten in touch with her and, you know, was explaining to her what, you know, what happened and everything. And she had made plans to come down and take care of Bob's stuff. Well, it took her about a week to, you know, be able to come down and do something with Bob's stuff because she ended up cremating Bob. Well, I saw Bob in a couple more places in the mobile home. And there was some other that very weird things in the home that I came across, such as tons of black videotapes that had weird, questionable stuff on and filing cabinets full of women's clothing and such. And Bob was showing me this and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know if he was trying to tell me that he wanted me to report that or whatever. But by the time his sister came in, she got rid of everything. And I told the police about it. But by the time they got back up there, it was all gone. The whole trailer was completely wiped out and everything was gone. That's the first time I ever saw somebody look like water. But since then, I've seen a few people that look like water. Sometimes I can't see them, but I can hear them. They come to me in different forms. And I've all, always kind of wondered, I didn't understand why I was this way. My mother used to tell me all the time that I was cursed. I was doomed because of this and that I was going to go straight to the pit of hell because I had all these gifts. And I come to find out that these gifts are spoken of in the Bible. So I didn't feel so ashamed about them anymore because in Acts chapter 2, verse 12, it says, in the end of days, I will pour out my spirit unto all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy because I would, I didn't know exactly what to do with my gifts. So people would come to me and they would have me read for them. People would have reading parties and I would go and I would read from them. But every time I would do this, I would get so exhausted. It just drains all of my energy. My mother kept telling me that it was horrible that I did that. and But I didn't know what else to do with it because I didn't know what my gift was for. I didn't know that for years. So a coworker of mine, she kept coming up to me saying, I want you to come out to my property and just walk around to see if you can feel anything. See if, you know, I just want you to walk around my property. We've had the property. It's over 300 acres in Maryville. And I want you to walk around the property 
And I want you to just see what you feel there. I eventually went over there one night. It was right before Christmas. We were going to, was going to trade her something for an acoustic guitar, I believe, for my son. It was nighttime whenever I pulled up over there. And she lives on this beautiful property that's, like I said, 300 acres. She's got this big, beautiful, gorgeous house that's got all these beautiful big windows in it. And she's out in the middle of nowhere. Whenever I pulled into the driveway, I get out and she comes out and she greets me, you know, and we go into the house. We walk in through the garage there and go in through the kitchen. And, you know, it's dark outside and she's got all of her, (laughs) she's got all of her windows, the blinds up. And as soon as I walk in her kitchen, I'm like, oh my gosh, the hair stands completely up on my neck and my arms everywhere, just all over me, like static electricity. And I said, Lisa, do you leave these blinds up like this all the time? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, why? And I said, well, uh, because don't you feel that? And she said, feel what? What do you feel? And I said, all those people looking at you. I said, what? do you live around a lot of people? And she said, no, there's no one that lives here. So you feel that, huh? And I was like, well, yeah, I feel that. And she said, I was wondering if you'd feel that too. And I said, you're setting me up. What do you mean? And she said, well, she said, I've lived here my whole life. And she said, me and my sister, we've always felt eyes looking at us on this property. And I said, well, yeah, I said, it's taken my breath. And she said, yeah, it actually is mine, too. She said, it's like they know you're here or something, and it's stronger than it's ever been tonight. And so we went and we sat down on her couch. She had like a love seat and a couch and they were kind of facing each other in the living room. And I went and sat down and I couldn't move. I was frozen by this energy that I was feeling. It was just so intense in her house from the outside. I mean, it was just like seeping through the windows. It was so thick. She was like, Wendy, I'm scared. I've never felt it this bad before. I'm scared. I can't move. And I said, I can't move either. And so that lasted for about 10 minutes and we just couldn't move and we were just petrified. After the sense of it kind of died down a little bit, I was talking to her and I looked over her shoulder and I kind of looked into this sunroom she's got. It's got a big, beautiful bay window and she's got like, you know, furniture out there you can set in the big window area. I saw this Native American man. I mean, I'm Native American myself. And it may be one reason why they were so drawn to me, but there was this Native American man (laughs) with peeking around the window and he had long white hair. It was straight and it was gray white and it went down to his chest and he was looking around the window and I said, Lisa, who is that? And she said, who's what? What are you talking about? And I said, that gray haired man in the window, who is that? And she said, Wendy, there's nobody that can be standing at that window. I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, walk over there to the window and look out. It was dark, of course. I couldn't see out. But I walked over to the window and she had lights down on the bottom part of her house. And I could see the ground and I could see that it was about a 40 foot drop to the ground. So there was no way this man could have been standing there. And that scared me to death. She said, I'm really kind of scared about you going home now because I feel like something's going to go with you. And I said, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I'll be fine. I'll be okay." So, you know, we visit a little bit longer and I get in the car and I run to the car from her garage because it was so intense. It took my breath. I couldn't hardly walk outside her house because of it. She's got these trees, like this tree line down below her house in the lower part of the yard that goes all the way around her family's property. And every one of those trees, I could see Indians standing there and they were all looking at me intensely like they wanted me to see them. I said, Lisa, I've got to go. So I came home. It was like December the 23rd, whenever this happened and probably around 2000 nine, whenever this happened, I came home and it was cold outside, came in the house and I came in my bedroom. I had to go down into the basement to get a mirror for a project that I was working on. 
my ex at the time, he said, I'll go down to the basement and get the mirror for you. And I said, okay. So he comes back up and he says, I can't go into the basement right now. And I said, why? And he said, because it's completely full of flies down there. And I said, flies? Why does it have flies in it? It's in the middle of winter. How can it have flies in it? And he said, the basement is completely full of flies. So I walked down there and the basement was completely full of flies. That was a very weird experience. And I called Lisa and I told her about the experience. And she said, I told you one of them was going to go with you. I sensed it whenever you left. And from that point on, she wanted me to go to her great, great grandfather's house. Well, things were starting to happen at my house. There's always been things that happen at my house, I think, because of all the spiritual activity that's gone on in my life and that I have spirits that follow me home and stuff. So at my house has always had some kind of activity in it. I have to cleanse it often. But she wanted me to come out to her great grandfather's house. Everybody talked about this house, about how it was haunted. One of my great late friends, Diane, she passed away not too long ago, in June last year. She wanted me to go in it. Her and Lisa both wanted me to go in that house to see what I sensed in it because it was called the house at the end of the 13 curves. I think it's near old Severeville Highway in Maryville. So finally, we did. We went over there in the middle of the day. Whenever I'm walking up to this house, I mean, it's this big, old, beautiful house. It was built in the 1700s and it's got this porch that wraps around it and the porch doesn't have the square edges that it's rounded. The edges of the porch are rounded and it's really beautiful. And I was walking up to the house and all I had was a cell phone to take pictures with. And so I was going up to the door and there was this spirit standing in the doorway with its arms out. Well, I took a picture of it. I didn't know that it was going to show up as well as it did, but it does show. I do have the pictures showing the spirit standing in the doorway as if to say, don't come any farther, go away. Well, we went on in anyway. And this this house, uh, Lisa's great, great grandfather built this house. And he was a very prominent man in Maryville. He had a lot of property and stuff. Well, this was his house. And she takes me through the house. We go upstairs and there is so much spiritual activity in this house. It takes my breath whenever I walk into it. And Lisa said she's always heard things and always, you know, wondered about the house. So she didn't really tell me anything about the history of whose room was what inside the house. She just wanted me to look and walk through the house and give her descriptions of what I seen and felt inside the house. There was a lot of history in that house. We went upstairs and this is the second place that I saw spirits who look like water. They were moving in and out of the house, in and out the windows upstairs. There was this one place on the wall upstairs where somebody had written on the wall. It looked like blood. I don't know what it was, but there was a lot of people that used to, homeless people and stuff would come in this house and they would stay, do drugs. I don't know what all they did in there, but there was a lot of negative energy in this in this house. And I looked over to the wall and it just had the words written in, it looked like blood to me, sorry. I was taken back by that. I sensed this person actually had passed away in that house due to a drug overdose. I also sensed this young man that was wheelchair bound in that house and She had told me, yes, that was a relative of hers. And she was giving me descriptions of, you know, him and stuff. And so we go downstairs and there are carvings on the walls. It's drawings of this. I guess it's a person that they're trying to draw on the walls. And it's saying, I'm in here. And there's arrows pointing toward the kitchen. And whenever you go into the kitchen, It says on the back of the door, it says, look down and die. Like I said, I've got pictures of all this stuff. And we go into the kitchen and there's this big, huge cistern in the floor. And I had never seen anything like that ever. Me and Diane are are taking our, our heads and we're hanging over the cistern and we're trying to, I'm trying to take pictures of it, but oh, it just, the sense of, 
the negative spirit that comes up out of that cistern makes you so nauseous that I can't even put my head over it and try to take pictures. Neither can Diane. She's getting nauseous. We can't hover over it. So I'm taking my camera and I'm just holding it over the cistern in the middle of it and just taking pictures, letting it snap pictures, hoping that I was going to get something out of it because you couldn't see down in it. It was dark and I had the flash on. So I was trying to take pictures that way. So we're walking through the house and there's all kinds of spiritual activity from different generations that have lived in this house that have been tortured in this house. And while we're upstairs, I took a picture up underneath the stairwell. I couldn't get near it either because there was a stairwell. Like if you have a pull down from the attic, it looked like it would go up in there like it would have those pull down stairs, but there was nothing there. It was kind of sealed up. I tried to stick my head inside the enclosed area and I couldn't because the spiritual activity coming from that area was so strong that it made me nauseous. So I just stuck my phone in there and just started snapping pictures, looking up at the ceiling to see if I got anything. And whenever I pulled it back, it showed stairs going up in the attic that were backwards. It was like they were upside down going into the attic. And Lisa wanted me to come back over there and go in the attic, but I refused to go over there and go in the attic. But anyway, we come downstairs. We went out on the front porch. There's a screened in area. I was out on the front porch looking down the side of the house. There was this space, you know, in between the side of the house and this big tree. It was probably about 10 feet out from the house and I was going to take a picture and I raised my phone up to take a picture, but there was already a picture there that I didn't take. I looked at it and I was like, I didn't take this picture. And I said, Lisa, Diane, come here and look at this. And they said, what are you looking at? And I said, well, I didn't take this picture. And I said, there's all this black matter in between the house and the tree. And there's nothing there. Do you see any of this right here? I said, do you see any of that that's coming from the picture? Look down the side of the house. So they look down the side of the house. There's nothing there. There's nothing in between the tree and the house. And I was like, well, I don't know. I just kind of blew it off as a fluke. Well, I came home and I uploaded my pictures on the laptop. My oldest son came over and we were all looking through the pictures. And my oldest son said, we came upon that picture the one where I was taking the picture inside the cistern. And he said, mom, look at that. There's a face inside the cistern. And sure enough, if you look at it and you flip through the pictures, you can see this face. It looks so angry. It looks so evil. And it has this raging look on its face and its mouth is wide open. Its face is turning in a circular motion in each one of these pictures. It's turned a little bit more. It's just because I just had it on a higher shutter speed where it just sit there and snap pictures for, you know, a few seconds. And in each one of them, the face is turned a little bit more. I found that very interesting. And then there's a video that I took that I didn't realize that I had taken was upstairs and we were standing next to the wall that said, sorry, it was me and Diane. And Diane in the video walks by and bumps the camera. She says, oh, I'm sorry. And the camera just zooms straight over to the wall where it says, I'm sorry. And it just really gave me the creeps. Then I'm looking at the picture in between where I picked it up and it was in between the house and the tree. And my son says, mom, look at that. And I said, what is it? What do you see? I said, I've been trying to figure out what that is. And he said, look up toward the roof of the house. And so I looked up toward the roof of the house and there its face was. The blackness in between the house and the tree was this huge demonic figure in this black cloak and you could see his face and it was the face that was in the middle of that cistern and he had that angry screaming look on his face well the tree next to him you could see his fingers wrapped around the tree in the picture 
And down toward the bottom of his cloak, you could see all these little faces all over his blackness down toward the bottom of his cloak. It was all over it. Well, that freaked me out a little bit more because I didn't see that, but I could sense that evil in that house. This house is right at the bottom of Lisa's driveway in the same area where all these spirits came over me and overwhelmed me on her property. About six weeks later, my youngest son started getting suicidal thoughts and depressed very, very badly. He wouldn't leave the house. It was very, very bad. He was only like nine at the time. He was having a very bad time with it. And my brother is a pastor, and I called him, and I said, do you believe in Satan? I mean, do you really believe in Satan? And he said, yeah. He said, I do. What? Why do you ask? And I said, I want you to look at this picture that I'm going to send you, and I want you to tell me what you see. So I sent the picture of the demonic entity in between the house and the tree to him, and he said, yeah, that looks kind of like Satan to me. And so he said, you need to read the book of Job. So I tried to read the big book of Job, it talked about how Satan moved to and fro throughout the earth. So I was trying to do everything I could to cleanse my house because I had realized that this spirit had gotten into my house and was attacking my son at night. Went through the house with sage like I used to do. I used to go through the house with sage to cleanse it. And I finally went through the house with the Lord's Prayer I told it to get out. I was angry by this point and I told it to get out and I took all the pictures and the video and I downloaded it onto a CD and I wrapped it in black cloth and I sealed it and put it away and it went away. It finally stopped. As the year has gone on, I have tried my best not to go anywhere in those areas I used to go into people's houses and cleanse them and see what kind of spirits were in the houses for them and communicate with people for other people. I mean, I would communicate with the dead. I had an experience. I'm going to go ahead and tell you some about celebrity experiences. I had no idea who some of these people were. I mean, I'd heard of them, but I knew nothing about them. There are some of them that I really didn't ever hear about, but come to find out they were famous people. But the very first one that ever contacted me was back in 2007. And I did not like this woman. I was not the type of person that liked the things that she did and stuff. But Anna Nicole Smith had collapsed and I was at work. I was doing things at work. I am uh, an administrative business as far as like a physician billing and stuff. I was doing some stuff on the computer and it popped up on MSN that Anna Nicole Smith had collapsed. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever, no big deal. Then it came back over and said she had passed away. You know, it didn't phase me any. I didn't, you know, think anything about it. And then on my way home, I don't remember my way home. It's the weirdest thing. I don't remember my way home. I don't remember I don't remember my drive home, should I say. I don't remember how I got home. I don't remember anything about after that point. Probably about 10 minutes after I saw that she had passed away, that was it. I didn't remember anything else that evening. That night I had the strangest dream. I dreamt that I was looking out my bedroom window, which is my house is up higher than everyone else's in my subdivision. And I was looking out my bedroom window and I could see over into my neighbor's yard in my dream. And there was this big bed laying there in my in her yard. It was a big brass bed. And there was Anna Nicole Smith laying in this bed with her back to me, covered all the way up to her chin in this big white blanket, this big white duvet. She was crying and she had this big red bow in the back of her head. And I was you know, like, why am I dreaming about this chick? I have no idea. I don't, I don't know her. I don't like her. You know, why am I dreaming? She just kept crying and bawling. Look what he's done to me. Look what he's done to me. She said, hey, look what he's done to us. Well, you know, I, I didn't know that Anna Nicole Smith's son had passed away or anything like this, but she was talking about her and her son. All the while, 
It's the strangest thing. Ozzy Osbourne is standing in the street and he's singing No More Tears. It's pouring down the rain and it's pouring down right on top of him. I was just like, okay, whatever. I mean, you know, it's just a dream. And the dream flips over and I'm, I'm at this like Disney World or something. And Anna Nicole Smith comes up to me and she's wearing this slinky dress that looks like kind of that snakeskin type material, but it's all slinky and it's, it goes all the way to the floor, but it's split all the way from the floor all the way up to her hip. It's got these little spaghetti straps and she comes up to me and she says, look what he's done to us and starts to tattoo herself on my body. And I'm pushing her off, trying to get her off. And all the while she starts at my neck and she's tattooing herself all over my neck, all down my shoulders, all down me. And I'm pushing her off of me, but she just continues to tattoo herself on my body, on the whole left side of my body. Well, after she's done, I wake up. And then from that point on, for like three years, everything in my life became Anna Nicole Smith. Everything. She just continually aggravated me to death, wanting me to talk to her family, her friends, that she needed to tell them things. She had me get in touch with several of her friends and family members. I did hear back from four of her friends. One of them, she was telling me that he was online and that I needed to get in touch with him through YouTube. And I did. And all I did was send him an email and explain to him what she wanted me to say to him. And he ended up contacting me. The things that he said that confirmed I will say this. He said that it was just like talking to her face to face, the things that she would say, because I didn't know what she was going to say. She would just say the things and I would relay them to him. He was on the phone with me one night and he said, okay, I want you to tell me what you see, what she says that you see. And I said, okay. I said, she's showing me this house. I'm walking into this house. And whenever you go into this, the doorway, if you look to the left, there's this bar, like an eating bar. And if you look to the right, there is this black furniture that has, it's like from the 70s, but it's leather and it's got the legs, the wooden legs underneath it. There is a photo album laying open on the couch and it's got all this frilly ruffles all the way around it. And she's saying, I'll change his name just for security purposes. But Freddie, look at this. Look at the picture. Look at the picture. He is saying, I don't, I don't know what you mean. I, I don't know this place. I don't know this place. I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, she keeps saying to look at the picture. Look at the picture. Her hair is in braids in the picture. It gets quiet on the phone. And all of a sudden, he goes, oh, my God. And I said, what do you see? And he said, I've got this big, huge picture that Anna gave me and she autographed it to me. And on the outside of the glass, there's this Polaroid picture. It's of Anna and she's got braids in her hair. She's got cornrows braids in her hair. And behind her is that couch with that photo album and it's open on that couch. And he said, oh my God, this is amazing. I can't believe this. So He said, what else? What else is she telling you? And I said, well, I said, she's showing me this big yellow platter. I said, she's standing in the kitchen of this house. And there's there's three other women there with her. She's holding this big yellow platter with this big chocolate cake on it. And you're there with her. And he said, that was my birthday. That was the day that she made me a cake. And that's my sisters and my mother. And she had made me in my birthday cake and put it on that big yellow platter. And that platter stays on my mother's table. And she won't let anybody touch that platter. She says, that's Anna's plate and nobody's allowed to touch it. And he just bawled and bawled. So Anna filled my life for like three or four years. I mean, it was unbelievable how she just took over everything. Then other people started coming out of the woodwork. like. Muddy Waters. I didn't know what that was. I had never 
had any any idea. And my ex was really into music. And he said, Muddy Waters is an old blues singer. I said, what? So I started looking and that, sure enough, it was an old blues singer. But he, Muddy Waters came up and told me that Etta James, his friend Etta James was going to pass away before her birthday. I wrote it down in my journal and she sure enough did. And so I realized that this whole thing with Anna had opened up some sort of portal. And there was many of these celebrities coming through. Just to name a few of them was Sharon Tate and Jay Sebring. I had no idea who they were. Didn't keep up with any of that. I do realize that a lot of these people are connected in ways. Somehow, some way they're connected. Oh, another one that was really big and prominent was Nirvana's Kurt Cobain. He still comes by every now and then, him and uh, a few others. But the last one that came by was Jim Morrison. And I knew the Doors, you know, I listened to the Doors and stuff growing up, but I didn't know really who he was. I didn't know. I thought he was this old, lousy drunk that didn't really do anything. But Jim became one of my best friends. He was like the best friend I could ever have. It was really unreal. Come to find out, Jim Morrison was very intelligent. He was a very talented writer, and he was so smart, so very, very smart. And he had a big heart, and he gave to everyone. And he just kind of hung out, and I contacted some of his band members. Ray Manzarek, he got back in touch with me a little bit about Jim, and Jim was telling me to tell him that it wasn't so bad. It wasn't what they expected, but it wasn't so bad. I had all these spirits all the time around me, you know, all the time. One day, my ex that I was with, he was kind of brutal and mean to me. So one day, this was in April 2011, I went down in the carport, me and him were arguing, and I was still paying on uh, the car that I had financed. And I really, at the time, really couldn't afford to break off on my own. I had a, you know, son at home that was still school age. And, you know, I was scared to do it on my own, as most, you know, women are sometimes. And so I was out in the carport and I was cussing like a sailor. And uh, I was screaming. And I said, you know what? I said, all you spirits, I'm always helping y'all out. I'm always helping y'all out. I'm always contacting everybody that you want me to contact. I'm your voice when you don't have one. Why can't y'all help me out and help me pay off my bleepity bleep car so that I can leave him? Well, like 10 minutes later, the skies turned completely black outside and tornadoes hit East Tennessee. The winds came through and they tore up a bunch of stuff around my house. Within like a month, I had my insurance money and had everything fixed and I had enough left over to pay off my car. And I was like, whoa, that's kind of cool. You know, I, it was just very interesting that they had come through for me. After I paid off my car, Anna's friend, the one that I talked to a lot, he wanted me to come out and move out to Hollywood and be like a uh, psychic to the stars. And I was all ready for it. I wanted to do it. I didn't know what else to do with my gifts. So why not, you know? I mean, my mother always told me that I was condemned to hell. So, you know, there was nothing I could do about it. So why not? So I was going to move out to California and do that. All the while, paid off my car and everything. And I kept having this premonition that I was going to total my car. Wasn't, of course, going to be on purpose, but I was going to total my car on Alcoa Highway on my way to work one day. So I told my brother, my mom and everybody, and they were like, why do you say that? Why do you say such horrible, horrible things? Why? And I said, I'm not trying to be negative or anything. I'm telling you what I see. I see my car is going to be straight. It's going to be head on or something. I'm going to total my car. And they're like, you're so negative. You shouldn't say that stuff. And I said, well, it is what it is. You know, I was on the phone with my insurance company. While I was at work one day and I was having trouble with them over something and I was cussing like a sailor on the phone and this woman comes up to me and her name was Jennifer at work and I was always kind of rude to her because she would go around and she was always happy and joyful and, you know, I was always raging and mad and 
she was always kind of, you know, happy and go lucky. And she was always walking around saying Shalom. And I was like, I don't have no idea what that means, but whatever. Well, she came up to me and she had this stained glass angel with four little bells hanging from it. And she said, here, God told me to give you this. And I said, what? What do you mean God told you? I said, well, that's beautiful. You know, thank you. And she said, I had it hanging from my rear view mirror in my car. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's cool. So come home and I had found some new music and stuff that I had never heard Jim sing before. And I downloaded it and I was so excited. You know, I was like, okay, tomorrow, you know, it's going to be a better day. You know, my day kind of sucked at work, but, you know, I'm going to have a better day the next day. I'm going to have some music I can listen to that I've never heard Jim sing before. And so I was like, oh, yeah, I better go take that angel down there and hang that in my car. So I took it down and I hung it from my rear view mirror in my car. Well, the next day I am on my way to work and I'm sitting there and I'm talking to Jim. You know, he's next to me and we're talking. And I said, "Um, Jim, man, I said, you are the best friend anybody could ever have. And I said, I'm so, so glad that I've had this opportunity to know you. And I said, I just really, I love you, man. You're awesome. You're the best friend a person can ever have. And I said, you know what? I said, I'm not going to pray to God anymore because God just has never answered my prayers about anything really. You know, I've always prayed to him and everything and he never answered my prayers. So I'm not going to pray to him anymore. I said, I'm just going to talk to you, Jim. I said, you, you know, help me pay off my car and everything. I said, That's, you're just fantastic. And at that point, I felt God reach down in my stomach and he said, I didn't give you that gift for that. And he jerked my stomach up. And like 10 seconds later, I was in a five car pileup on Alcoa Highway. There was cars there and I came up over the hill and I was trying to slow down. And this Jeep came up behind me. There was all these cars stopped in front of me over the hill. And this Jeep came up behind me and picked my car up and slammed me into the cars in front of me. And all the while I'm sitting in the car and the windows, it was daylight, but the windows, I couldn't see out them. Everything went black and the inside of my car just lit up like really, really, really bright. It was the brightest light I'd ever seen, but it wasn't hurting my eyes. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to burn up in this car. I'm going to burn up. But then I thought, you know, no, I'm going to be fine. Nothing's going to hurt me. For some reason, I got a peace over me. I knew right then that I wasn't going to die in this car accident. Something was protecting me. And I felt like I was sitting in a bubble. Well, all the while, that Jeep hits me in the rear end and slams me into those other cars. It flips him over the side of the embankment. And here comes another truck, a King Cab. Chevrolet truck and I can hear it going toward toward the back of my car and all I can do is sit there and say oh Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus that's all I could say oh Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus and then he hit me and slammed me in there again and it just kept slamming my car like it would be an accordion after everybody stopped hitting me I finally get out of the car the police are there and everything and I'm standing on the side of the road and I realize Everybody says, look at your car. It looks like a bubble because the whole front end and the back end was smashed in. But the car was bubbled up on top, but no window in that car shattered. And it had six airbags and not one of them deployed. I was completely safe without a scratch on me. It was the strangest thing ever. I was like, okay, from this point on, I I need to know exactly what is it that you've given me this gift for. I I need to know what you've given me this gift for. I came home and I was standing in the bathroom and I was crying at this point because I didn't understand. I've had this my whole life, this ability to see all this stuff. And I mean, it's kind of like a curse, honestly, to see all this stuff that you don't want to see that just pops in your life uninvited. You see all this stuff. It's always been kind of like a curse to me. So I didn't understand. And I was like, okay, you know, my mother's always told me that I was going to burn in hell for this. So God, tell me, explain to me why you have given me these gifts. Why? And all of a sudden, while I was standing there in the bathroom, that bright light, it was so bright. It lit up the whole bathroom. And I could see the shadow down at my feet of me, of my body. And all of a sudden, I heard my ex in the living room and he was cussing. And he was screaming at the TV. And I said, what is the problem? And I walked in there and 
the CBN network, it's the Christian Broadcast Network, I think is the name of it. And across the bottom of the TV, it was scrolling and it says, I have given you these gifts to edify the body of Christ. And I was like, what do you mean? And from that point on, I've been on a journey, you know, trying to figure out exactly why I have these gifts. I feel like he's given me these gifts to prove who he is and that I see the, the realm that other people don't. There is a spiritual realm all around us at all times. And some people see it and they don't even realize that's what they're seeing. And some of them are spirits, I believe, that have not crossed over. Some of them are demonic. That can be many different things, but I still experience it every day. And it's something that you just have to try to ignore a lot. Some of them, like Anna, some of them are so strong that it can come in and take over your life if you let it, which it's, you know, kind of hard to even tell sometimes whenever they're around because I'm trying to block them off. I always get like pains in my neck and my shoulders and my back a lot whenever they're around. Any kind of electronic I have, any kind of, uh, I mean, they die. The, the batteries just drain in any kind of electronic device that I have. They drain very quickly. I've had so many experiences. Me and my husband have been hiking the last few years and We've had so many experiences in the woods concerning many different things. And that's a whole new world opening up to me. Like the dog man, we heard howls. It sounded just like what they have described that sounds like. And that petrifies me. I have, you know, seen Bigfoot. That's also another thing that seems to attract to me. But my whole life has been this. And so those are my, some of my paranormal experiences. If you've had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us by going to myparax.com. That's my para e x dot com. Thanks for listening.